This episode is sponsored by PrepDish. PrepDish takes the stress out of putting homemade healthy meals on the table. No more scrambling to figure out what's for dinner at the last minute. <laughs> Make sure to head over to PrepDish.com slash Fertility Friday, all lowercase, to get your first two weeks of meal plans free of charge. This is the Fertility Friday podcast, episode number 116. Welcome to the 116th episode of the Fertility Friday podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com, and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. Happy New Year! Oh my goodness, I can't believe that it is 2017 already. I don't know what to say. (laughs) 2016 went by in a flash, and here we are. But I'm so happy to be here with you today. I'm really excited for what the new year is going to bring, and I'm really excited for today's episode. And so I don't always do a little preamble, but I'm doing one because um, I guess you could say one of the themes of 2016 that I saw with a lot of my clients was the challenges that they had, especially when going to their regular garden variety allopathic doctors and requesting certain certain tests, especially with regards to thyroid health. And so all of my longtime listeners will know that we've talked about thyroid quite a bit on the show and how deeply it can impact the menstrual cycle. And so for those of you who may not have listened to a ton of episodes or if you're joining for the first time, well, welcome. But the important thing to know is that thyroid disorder and thyroid dysfunction is one of the number one causes for menstrual cycle dysfunction, because when your thyroid is off, your entire hormonal balance is off. But unfortunately, (laughs) there's just, there's a different approach. So most traditionally trained medical doctors have a very specific, narrow approach when it comes to thyroid health. And it's often irregardless of how you feel and how you do on their preferred medication, their preferred testing protocol. And so what I found is that when I send my clients (laughs) to the doctor to get their thyroid tested and they want a full panel, oftentimes their doctors are not only not willing to do it, but often very thorny. So it's, it's, it's beyond just like, no, I'm not going to do it to like, those tests aren't necessary. You don't need any of that stuff. What I find really interesting is that the response isn't just like, no, it's often quite negative. So I'm really excited to share my interview with you today. Uh, Today, I interview Janie Bothorp, who is the author of the book, Stop the Thyroid Madness. She was able to, after years and years and years of an untreated thyroid condition, she was able to, to really figure out what was going on and start to actually feel better. And so I really hope this episode is helpful for those of you who have had challenges in approaching your physicians, or if you're thinking about approaching your physician for certain things, hopefully it gives you the confidence, especially if you end up having a negative experience, because um, unless your physician has taken a specific interest in thyroid function, chances are your experience will be very similar to most women's experience. And of course, I just want to remind all of you that the information that we talk about in the Fertility Friday podcast is, of course, for informational purposes only, and it's not intended to be medical advice. And I also wanted to let you know that I'm still accepting applications for my January program. So they're actually starting within a week or two. (laughs) So if you've been thinking about it, or if you have been hesitant to jump on, this is the last call. (laughs) And if you're listening to it in real time, there's still time to apply. If you're listening to this episode a little bit later in the year, then you can still head over to the group program page and uh, jump on the waiting list for the next round of groups. So you'll find that at fertilityfriday.com slash group program. Before we jump into today's episode, I want to take a moment to thank my sponsor, PrepDish. My longtime listeners will know that I spent a huge amount of time talking about the importance of getting your nutrition from food whenever possible, and especially when you're working to improve your fertility naturally. It does start with real food, and PrepDish helps you sort out all of those details. So if you haven't heard of PrepDish, PrepDish is a meal planning service, which is amazing. So instead of coming home at the end of the day and scrambling to figure out what you're going to put on the table for your family, every week you get an email from PrepDish with a shopping list. So it's like, hey, go to the store, pick up these things, and then come home and spend about two to three hours prepping 
for the entire week. And so when you come home on a Thursday night and you're super tired and you don't feel like cooking, you already have your meal prepared for you in the fridge and ready to go. And so I can't recommend the service highly enough. And PrepDish has created a special offer for the Fertility Friday community. So make sure to head over to PrepDish.com slash Fertility Friday and you'll get the first two weeks of meal plans completely free of charge. And now let's jump into the show. And today I'm so excited to welcome Janie Bothorpe to the show. Janie has spent years as one of the most well-known and heartfelt thyroid patient advocates fighting for better thyroid care. And what has made her different from others in this field is her unique focus, which has always been about reported patient experiences and the wisdom gained from those experiences rather than strong opinions uh, regarding the medical establishment. And um, in our pre-chat, Uh, Janie and I were briefly talking about the challenges that particularly women, because I work with women, face when they think they may have a thyroid condition and they really want the support from their health professionals. Uh, But, you know, when they're actually seeing those health professionals, they often have a difficult time getting the support that they need. So I'm so excited to welcome Janie to the show. So welcome. Thank you for being here today. Oh, thank you, Lisa. I'm really glad to be here. And I know we'll have a lot of important and life changing information to talk about. Absolutely. And so just to give the listeners more of a history about you, you're the author of the book Stop the Thyroid Madness. And I would love for you to introduce yourself and just share what it was that inspired you to write that book and share your message. Okay, it's it's actually even um, that that was later. What what really uh, went on is I spent 20 years, almost 20 years, on the typical treatment for hypothyroidism. It was Synthroid and it was Lavoxyl. That was those are both T4 only medications. And the entire time I was on these widely prescribed medications, I didn't get well. And in fact, I got worse and worse. And I was getting so bad that I was going from doctor to doctor saying, what is wrong with me? Why am I having these problems? And I was never told it was my thyroid. I was always told it's not your thyroid, you're normal. And um, and I kept getting worse and worse. And they did all these bizarre tests on me to see what was wrong with me. Um, I even had a muscle biopsy, which was painful. I did other painful tests. Nothing came through to explain why I was getting worse and worse. And finally, I had to take things into my own hands. I this was, you know, this was kind of pre-internet, pre-strong internet. Um, it was there, but uh, and I was using it, but it isn't like it is today, where you have millions of groups. I finally on my own decided, okay, I don't believe a word they're saying. Let's look at coincidence. The only thing that I have wrong with me that I'm on a medication for is thyroid. So that made me go back into looking into that, found out about a different treatment, got on that, and my life began to change completely. So when I say things happened before that, the first thing that happened when my life changed completely is I began a a group. Now, then Facebook wasn't strong. There was Yahoo groups that still exist today. (laughs) And I said, I started this group to spread the word, hey, look what natural desiccated thyroid has done for me. What's going on with the rest of you out there? And it was through the, that group that patients were joining left and right. We were talking and talking and comparing notes, and we had to do some experimentation. That led to the creation of the Stop the Thyroid Madness and then the creation of the book. Mm-hmm. Well, what a journey, 20 years. Um, and you mentioned, you know, that you had these symptoms and that you were getting worse. Would you be able to share with the audience what some of those symptoms were, kind of paint a picture of how you were feeling? Sure. Understand, though, that my story of not doing well on only one of five hormones can be different from other people's stories. 
So what happened to me was was unique to me, but the point is is that millions of us apparently have continued hypothyroidism when we are treated with only one of five thyroid hormones, namely Synthroid and Levothyroxine, which are the more common T4 only meds. So the continued uh, symptoms will vary. Um, for a lot of people, there a continued need to take a nap um, in the afternoon. That's a key symptom of continued hypothyroidism or rising cholesterol or rising blood pressure or hair loss or extremely dry skin or dry hair or losing your outer eyebrows. And when we have had those symptoms, um, our doctor said, oh, no, it can't be your thyroid. You're adequately treated and your TSH is normal. That's a lab test. But to the contrary, I found out, as did many people, that no, it is not normal for us as hypothyroid patients to have rising cholesterol, rising blood pressure, dry skin, dry hair, falling out eyebrows, chronic depression. Of course, it varies from person to person. And it's because it's an inadequate treatment. Mm -hmm. Well, it's so interesting because in the work that I do, um, I teach fertility awareness charting. So I teach women to understand their menstrual cycles and also to make the connection between how their menstrual cycle and their health work together. So for instance, if a woman has an untreated thyroid disorder, it will show up often in a number of different ways on her chart. So some women might have kind of a delayed ovulation, they might show lower temperatures, they might have um, just, you know, there's a lot of different ways it can show up. Um, and so, you know, often, especially uh, if a woman is struggling with fertility challenges, it, it's something that, that she'll want to rule out. It's something that she'll want to kind of look into, make sure that it's either an issue or not. And so when a woman is concerned that she may have a thyroid uh, condition, maybe you could talk a little bit about what some of those challenges are when she goes to her regular GP and um, asks for testing. Yes, I can um, talk about what you need to do with doctors. And I want to say that, again, there's individual reactions to being hypothyroid. And there are a group of women that one of those symptoms is the inability to get pregnant or having menstrual problems. It doesn't happen to everybody, but it happens to enough of them that we thought there's a good connection there, a bad connection. So here's the problem with doctors that everybody has to face. They are trained in medical school to go by a lab test called the TSH. That stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. Everybody will have that tested if they go to the doctor saying, I wonder if I have hypothyroid. Well, there's a problem with that. The thyroid stimulating hormone is a messenger hormone. It's released by your pituitary to tell your thyroid to produce. So theoretically, if the TSH goes high, then, it's, then you're probably hypothyroid because it's, it's releasing and releasing and releasing, trying to tell your thyroid to produce, and it's not producing. So it goes high. But the problem is we found out, because remember, Stop the Thyroid Madness is about our experiences all across the board. We saw that many of us have a so-called normal TSH, yet we had raging hypothyroidism. So we learn pretty quickly that it can take years for that TSH lab test to rise high enough to reveal our hypothyroid state. In the meantime, we're getting worse and worse. So that's the first problem you're going to have with a the doctor. They're going to go by the TSH. Another test they will often go by, because that's how they're trained, is the T4. That is a storage hormone. It's meant to convert to the active thyroid hormone, T3. But the problem with that is it can be in the normal range, yet you are hypothyroid. Because the next thing we learned about the T4 and T3 is it's where it falls that means something, not the fact that it falls in that range. So there you go. You go to a doctor. I think I may be hypothyroid. It may explain some of my problems. They're going to do the TSH and the T4, and they're often going to say, you're normal. 
don't believe it. What we learn, like I said, is where it falls. So when you get your lab result back, you pop the thyroid madness com forward slash lab values, L A B dash V is in Victor A L U E S. What is that page? It shows you what we saw over and over over the years that it's where you fall that gives you information, not the fact that it falls in the normal range. So that's the first thing you're going to have to deal with when you go see a doctor. The second thing, and I'll be quick, is if they finally agree that you're hypothyroid, which also for a lot of women can explain fertility and menstrual problems, then you're going to be faced with doctors only being trained about putting you on Synthroid or level thyroxine. That's only one of five hormones. Yes, some women and men feel better when they get on it. But you know what we noticed? Even those that feel better, the longer they're on it, the more hypothyroid symptoms are going to creep up. So the second thing you need to do, the first thing is learn about lab work. Second thing is you need to learn about how natural desiccated thyroid has changed lives. Why? It's got all five hormones not one. So again, you go back to Stop the Thyroid Madness and the page called Natural Thyroid 101. Bottom line, you got to get informed before you go into that doctor's office and you got to quit putting all your apples in the doctor's cart by, based on what he says. Well, thank you for that breakdown. One of the things that I've said, uh, you know, to my clients and uh, that's come up on the podcast a number of times is that when you talked about lab results and understanding how to interpret them, uh, it's, a, it's a different range that your doctor would use versus if you went to, say, a functional practitioner who specializes in thyroid um, function, right? So your doctor looks at kind of more of a broad uh, lab range as normal, whereas a functional doctor or even a fertility doctor in the case of a woman who's trying to conceive will look at it differently, right? Like, so, um, no, no, it's, it's not quite like that. It doesn't matter what the ranges are. They are going to be different from facility to facility because each facility often uses their own testing, their own volunteers to come up with their ranges that's why you're going to see different ranges. That doesn't matter. And they still may go by, even the better doctors, a functional med doctor, may still go by that normal range, even if it's narrower or different. And no. you're, you're referring to the range kind of on the lab test itself? Or, yes. Yeah. And so what I, was, uh, what I was kind of referring to is more of like, not necessarily the range on the form, but the practitioner based on, you know what I mean? Like... Um, it just depends on what practitioner you go with. But there are, you know, functional practitioners who are actually informed about the thyroid who would look at a TSH level and say, well, that's that's kind of high. Whereas the exact same level, you'd go to your doctor and the doctor would say, well, that's totally normal. That's within the lab range on the form. Well, it, it because of Stop the Thyroid Madness, there are a growing body of doctors and they don't have to be functional med for this to be true, who are getting it better who are getting that actually you don't want to go by the TSH. Yes, it may finally reveal it when you go in. But what you want to go by is the free T3, not total, and the free T4, and learn where do patients fall in those ranges when they don't have a thyroid problem. That's what the lab values page is about. It's about where you fall in those ranges that has meaning. Now, I want to add, Though I agree with you that some doctors and some uh, of their chosen field within the medical practice is better than others, there is no doctor out there that is totally caught up with what we as patients know. So you can, sure, go to a functional med doctor. They are gener generally better than other doctors, but even a functional med doctor Oh, yeah, they may understand they should put you on desiccated thyroid, but here's what we notice. They don't understand how to raise it. They don't understand what to look for. So that is why Stop the Thyroid Madness exists. It's based on solid patient reports over the years, and it's meant to educate you so that you can guide whatever doctor you go to. Oh, I have so many questions. <laughs> 
<laughs> this Don't is great. Work. So, well, maybe you could talk a little bit about like the free T3 and the free T4 and what it tells us about just how well your thyroid is doing and why that is giving us more concrete information, say, than just the TSH by itself or the TSH and the, the T4. Okay. Let me explain that a healthy thyroid makes five hormones, T4, T3, T2, T1, and calcitonin. Luckily, we don't have to test all five of those, but we do find as patients, remember this is about our, our experiences worldwide and the wisdom we've gained, we do find that it is enough to test the T4 and T3, but we do not go by the total T4 and the total T3. When you have total in front of that or nothing in front of it, which also means total, it's testing both bound and unbound. Bound means it's bound by proteins and is going to carry it around. Unbound means it's available for use in your cells. Well, when you test total, you don't know how much of that is unbound versus bound. But when you test free T3 and free T4, ah, now you're testing what is available to your cells. That's a big difference. And we've learned where those need to fall. And on that lab values page, that's what I've reported in there. It's not my opinion. It's what patients have learned. And we go by that, not just the TSH. Um, and we especially, once we get on thyroid meds, we never go by the TSH. You know why? Because once you're on desiccated thyroid, which has all five hormones and you're raising it to find your optimal dose, you know what that TSH is going to do? It's going to go usually below the range. Uh-oh, you know what happens? Doctors freak out. Oh, no, you're going to get AFib. You're going to have heart disease. You're going to have bone loss. No, we're not. What they're referring to is when you have Graves' disease, the opposite of hypothyroidism, yes, the TSH goes quite low because your free T3 and free T4 go way high. That's hyperthyroid. Our TSH goes quite low not because we're hyperthyroid. It's just because we're taking over its job by giving ourselves the right amount of desiccated thyroid. So bottom line, you've got to teach your doctor to go by the free T3, that's what's available and unbound, and the free T4, and you've got to learn where it should fall, which the lab values page will help you. Well, I think that um, one of the challenges that, you know, many of my clients are facing and um, I think a lot of the listeners are facing as well is that when you kind of take it into your own hands to learn more about the thyroid and how it functions and, um, and also what testing you should look into and all those types of things, you end up in the doctor's office with a list. You know, I want you to test my free T3, my free T4. I want you to test my reverse T3, et cetera. And then your doctor looks at you and tells you that that's, um, those tests are useless. They're a waste of time. I'm not doing them. Um, they don't tell me anything additional. And in some cases, um, well, your TSH is normal, so there's no reason for us to test those. So um, how do you support, um, you know, people in that situation? Uh, who are finding that resistance from their physicians? I have three words that tell you what informed patients do. You fire them because they're not going to help you. You're going to get worse. If they're that closed-minded and won't do the right test, you're going to get worse. And I'm not, that's not my opinion. It's what patients report. Your doctor is working for you. He has a lot of knowledge, but he's working for you. And if you have a doctor that is closed-minded, won't do the right test, patients report firing them and doing what it takes to takes to find a more open-minded doctor. Now, the second thing that patients report doing, and it's very legal, is ordering their own lab tests. So if you go to the page on Stop the Thyroid Madness called Recommended Lab Work, this is also in the back of the revised STEM book with all the people in the front in the odds and ends chapter. That tells you what you need. And if you scroll below that, I list several lab facilities where you can order your own. So it's one or the other, but you've got to be more proactive. We have found as patients to get well. It can't be all in your doctor's hands because some of them will keep you sick. Well, and I would love for you to talk a little bit about, um, just about Synthroid. So Synthroid is a synthetic version of T4 only. So you have talked about 
uh, the five different hormones that your thyroid is actually producing. So when a person's TSH is high uh, and it shows up on a blood test, then your doctor is likely to prescribe Synthroid because that is the standard of care. That seems to be the go-to medication. And so Synthroid works very nicely to get the TSH back into the normal range. <laughs> but in terms of making an impact on how the, the patient actually feels, uh, some patients don't see the result in how they feel, even though their tests are normal. So maybe you could just share a little bit about why that is, what's the disconnect there, and why it is that, that some patients uh, don't do well on that T4 only. Oh, I, I can tell you a lot there. First of all, this is where you need to get into chapter two in the revised STEM book. I did a lot of research to find out why did they start uh, prescribing this. And I go into great detail base and I give uh, references where I got the information. They've been prescribing Synthroid or other T4 only meds since the early 60s. Now, th th here's why it's, and it's been a problem for millions of us over these years. It's, it's just horrible. Why has it been a problem? T4 is a storage hormone, also called a prohormone. It's meant to convert to the active hormone, which is T3. So when you are on T4 only, you are now forced to live for, for conversion alone. But you know what? A healthy thyroid doesn't force you to live for conversion alone. Yes, it makes a lot of T4, but it also makes some direct T3. It doesn't totally force you to live for conversion alone. So here's what happens when you're on T4. A lot of people, yeah, they can convert T4 to T3, and they're going to feel better. Then there's another uh, group of people like me. I must have some genetic mutation that I did not convert T4 to T3 well. I, was, I never got better on T4, and I got worse and worse the longer I was on it because I apparently do not convert T4 to T3 well. But you know those people that do better on it? Yeah, there are people who report feeling better, and they do better. And we believe them. You could be that one. But here's the next thing we've noticed. Even those who feel better, the longer they're on it, the more it's going to bite them in the behind. Because there are so many things that are going to stop you from adequately converting T4 to T3. So why get on it when, that, when that's proven by our reports to happen? Mm -hmm. Well, and I think the interesting, I'm, I'm, do, you know, do you know if they used to prescribe desiccated thyroid before the development of Synthroid? Good question. That is again in chapter two. With, I did a lot of research. Yes, um, beginning somewhere around the 1890s, they were starting to put uh, hypothyroid patients on desiccated thyroid. And it, back then it was from sheep. I've got some old antique thyroid bottles made from sheep. There are, uh, I forget what the other one is. And sorry, and they, could you quickly, for the listener who's like, what the heck is desiccated thyroid? Could you please go over that as well? <laughs> well, desiccated thyroid means that the pharmaceutical is using a thyroid from a pig. Uh, why waste it? You know, they're using pig for bacon. They're using it for ham. They also use that thyroid for us to treat us. And what they're doing is they're drying it. There's a process. I'm being very simple here. They're drying it, turning it into a powder and putting that together in a pill form. Now, in the 1890s, it wasn't a dried form. It was something I think they injected and, and it slowly became, not slowly, pretty quickly, it became a pill. Well, everybody was on desiccated thyroid, and it works if you find your right amount. Uh, until that which happened in the early 1960s, which I go into detail about in Chapter 2, we were all switched. There was a small body of people that managed to stay on it, but we were all switched to synthetic T4. So anyway, desiccated thyroid is usually porcine thyroid that has been powdered. There are some over-the-counter versions, which are bovine. Well, thank you for sharing. Because the reason that I asked that is because I do remember reading that, that um, that desiccated thyroid used to just be what they prescribed. And the reason that I wanted to talk about that is because there's a number of objections, as I'm sure you've heard them all, that physicians regularly will give to their patients as to why desiccated thyroid isn't good. So one of the things is that 
it comes from an animal and therefore the dosing is not accurate. I've heard that a number of times from my own physicians and I've heard that from my clients who say that because it's it's desiccated, because it's coming from, um, you know, porcine or bovine thyroid, that it is therefore not accurate dosing. So it's harder to, to get a correct dose for a patient. That is a bunch of bull. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me explain it. This. When it comes to using porcine thyroid, did you not know that there are, I think it's something like 150 different medical products that come from pigs that they use on us? And it's successful. They use heart valves, and I don't remember them all, but there is a website that tells that there's like, I think it's a high amount of pig parts for our well-being. So that that is silly to say because it comes from pigs, we shouldn't be using it. We We use it all the time in the medical field and successfully. Secondly, the weak excuse that they're using is based on the following. A health, a human thyroid makes 93% T4 and 7% T3. Direct. Uh, now remember that, 93.7. A pig thyroid makes 80% T4 and 20% T3. That's a great deal more T3. It has not harmed us. We just raise it until one of the one of the few things we look for is where does it put our free T3 and free T4 when we're optimal? It puts our free T3 towards the top part of the range and it puts our free T4 somewhere, you know, there's gray areas to everything, right around mid-range when we're optimal. And the third thing is our lives are changed. We have, my life has been changed now for 14 years thanks to pig thyroid and it's 80 20 and it, and I know of people that never got off of it they're rare who've been on it for 50 years and still don't have any hypothyroidism so those are weak excuses well and i have another one this is my current personal favorite i don't even know what to say about this one um but i've actually heard doctors say that it's harmful and it's dangerous and that if you uh say for instance if you're trying to conceive and you're trying to address your thyroid issue and you and you take it that it could actually like they like I would have to take you off of it if you get pregnant because it could harm the baby I've heard that you know if you're hearing this from your doctor it's time for another doctor because this is another area where we sought feedback from patients because remember I'm about patient reports and a lot of them I just don't put anything in the books and on stem based on one or two reports I put things in there based on many reports there have been many pregnant women on desiccated thyroid who have soared, and I have never heard of anybody whose baby was harmed because they were on all five thyroid hormones. Well, it's funny because I remember being, so I'll just share an experience that I had that was really, because um, I, I have hypothyroid, you've probably gathered that. And so, you know, I've had many arguments with my own doctor to the point that I just did exactly what you said. I found a new one. Um, but my doctor sent me to an endocrinologist. And I feel like the higher you go in terms of specialization, sometimes you just get a more closed minded person in front of you. And so I went to this endocrinologist and I've been taking personally desiccated thyroid for the last, let's say, <laughs> I don't know, 10 years. It was diagnosed a long time ago. And uh, I've done quite well on it. I've never really had any issues and I, I don't have any of this, you know, the symptoms, right? Like, I don't really, you know what I mean? I'm doing well. And so this endocrinologist tells me, um, you know, she, she's like, I noticed that you're, you're on desiccated thyroid. She said, I have hundreds of patients and not one of them is on it. So the first thing she wanted to do was to get me off of it. And she scrunched up her face and she said, you know, that comes from a pig, right? And she was really disgusted by the idea that we would be, you know, why would you to eat something from a, like, why would you take a medication that's derived from an animal source when you could get a synthetic version that's been perfectly, you know, created for this purpose, synthesized in the correct dose? And I looked at her and I was like, well, do you eat chicken? <laughs> um, you know what I mean? Because th there's that disconnect between, I don't know, I just thought that that was an interesting experience just at how closed minded. And I think, um, one of the reasons that I wanted to have you on the show was because I did want to kind of address this challenge that um, 
you know, that that people face when they're struggling with a thyroid condition and they they try to, you know, do all their research and get the information and try to get the support that they need, but they end up face to face with somebody who is just completely not open to what they're saying and really telling them exactly the opposite of everything that they've learned about their thyroid. Well, my answer is the same. You know, we don't need to go over this a long time, but they're all wrong and our experiences prove it. There are going to be stupid medical pro protect practitioners that make all the comments that we say that we've talked about. It's not worth your time to try to convince them otherwise. We have found it's worth your time to fire them and find a better doctor because there are now probably millions of us now on desiccated thyroid and our lives have changed and we're not dying or suffering ill effects. So it's, t you know, you're, you're going to have it, forget it. If you have that kind of a doctor, time to find a much better one. And so, yes, and so interesting as well, because that was what they used to prescribe. <laughs> so, like, it was fine before. So, um, so yeah. Um, well, in terms of then, um, I just wanted to then touch on the, like, and I think we've already touched on a little bit, but the whole concept of, like, your T4 or your TSH being normal, but you still not feeling better. And I just wanted you to touch on that because one of the things that you've mentioned a number of times is that you're focusing on the patients. You're focusing on the actual human beings, how they're doing, how they're feeling, what their levels are actually like, how their bodies are responding to this medication. And so I think it's, I personally think it's interesting that you could have a patient in front of you who's expressing to you that they don't feel good and they're having these symptoms and they're not really doing well. But because their TSH is normal, the doctor is going to say that everything's fine. So I would love for you to talk a little bit about that whole issue with the thyroid condition. Well, I, yeah, we it, it, again, you can't go by the TSH, period. You can't even do it on desiccated thyroid. Because, pay, and again, not my opinion, it's based on what patients have reported repeatedly. Even on a better treatment with desiccated thyroid, if a doctor keeps you in the normal range, what patients report is continued symptoms. Even if they feel better, there are still some continued symptoms. We just learned we do not dose by the TSH. We dose by the free T3 and the free T4. We dose desiccated thyroid by what is our heart doing? Is it improved? What is our blood pressure doing? Has it improved? Where's our temperature? Has it gone up where it should be? Now, one thing that we haven't talked about is what about people who get on desiccated thyroid and they get worse? Do you want to talk about that? Yes, that was going to be one of my next questions. I was going to ask if everybody does well on desiccated thyroid. Oh, everybody can do well. That's different. But, they, but there's a lot of things we have to be aware of. We had to learn this the hard way. If you have inadequate levels of iron, and or crazy levels of cortisol, in other words, too high and too low. Those are the people that get in trouble when they raise desiccated thyroid. In other words, you gotta have the right amount of iron and you gotta have the right amount of cortisol to soar on desiccated thyroid. Now remember when I say right amount, you go to the lab values page to talk, see what I'm talking about. So what we noticed over the years is some people as they were raising desiccated thyroid, their heart rate went up, they had palpitations, or they had anxiety, or they had shakiness. It's, again, it's, it's, it's different between person to person, or they felt worse. Ah, that's not because desiccated thyroid doesn't work. It's because it's revealing that you've got either inadequate iron or a cortisol problem. So if that is you, what we do as patients, what we learn to do, many of us over the years, bring the desiccated thyroid back down where we don't have those reactions. We'll still be hypothyroid, but we won't have those reactions. And get all four, not one, get all four iron labs, compare them to the lab values page. And if you have a suspicion that you've got an adrenal problem, you order and do a 24-hour adrenal saliva test and compare those results to the lab values page, almost across the board, because there are going to be some other reasons, but like 90 high amount, that's the reason somebody doesn't do well on desiccated thyroid. Now, there's also people who have active Lyme disease 
may not do well on desiccated thyroid. And so they do better getting on T3 only until they can adequately treat that. But again, for the rest of the people who don't do well, there's an explainable reason. Mm -hmm. And do you talk about iodine at all, the relationship there? Oh, yeah. Now, I don't go into great detail because I leave that up to the iodine experts. But I have a page on Stop the Thyroid Madness, and I mentioned it in the revised STEM book, that many patients have benefited from iodine use. Now, there are some negative reactions. We saw some people see things like Hashimoto's get worse. But what they fail to see is that there are patients who reported that as they kept going up on their iodine use, they finally reverse that. So I'd say, you know, as an introduction, everybody has to figure out for themselves whether iodine is for them. There's some per perfect testing you need to do. If you want in to get into more detail, go to the iodine expert group. There's two of them on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I think it's interesting because then for every even going to like the basics of how, like why we call it T4 and T3. We call it T4 because there's four iodine molecules attached to it. We call it T3 because there's three iodine molecules attached to it. So there's so many different factors here. And I think that um, I'd like to just switch gears before we kind of get to the gear down for our interview today and talk about some of the underlying causes. Because what we've been talking about today is the lab testing, you know, d replacing the hormone, right? So we're looking at this as a deficiency of hormones and we're trying to replace and find the, the correct dose to replace our natural hormones. But we're not, you know, we haven't really touched on the, the underlying causes. And so maybe you could talk a moment about Hashimoto's or uh, for those uh, for those uh, listeners who think to themselves, well, this is interesting, but is there a way for me to heal my thyroid so that I don't have to take thyroid medication at some point in the future? Okay, I will be honest with you that it is it is rare, even though we occasionally see it, for somebody to heal their thyroid problem. It, it seems to be, for most people, lifelong. Now, what are the exceptions if somebody has Hashimoto's? Not everybody does, but if somebody has Hashimoto's, catches it really quick, and reverses that attack on the thyroid, occasionally, it's not often, they can go without thyroid hormones. But the problem is most people don't catch it quick enough, and it's been destroying their thyroid too long. So I've seen that. Secondly, I have seen some, some cases where their hypothyroidism was actually secondary. It was caused by extremely high cortisol due to extreme stress, because when you have high cortisol, the T4, instead of converting to the active T3, is going to start converting to the inactive RT3. So then you have secondary hypothyroid. So when you bring the stress down, which brings the cortisol down, you get rid of your hypothyroid state. So, but for the, it seems like, this is our observation, for the majority, it doesn't happen. It doesn't reverse because there's so many reasons. One, there's a hereditary reason. I think I have that. There are certain genes that I mention on the causes of hypopage. Um, another one, of course, is I said Hashimoto's, but so often we don't catch it quick enough. Um, it's, you could, people have a genetic predisposition to autoimmune diseases, and that's why Hashimoto seems to happen. Um, there, are, there are proposals that it's a gut cause. I don't know, you know, but you can always look into those. Um, of course, there are people that get it because they had graves and had to be treated, and that made them hypothyroid. There are people who had cancer, had it removed, they're hypothyroid, um, a tumor on the pituitary gland. It just goes on and on and on, and not all of these are reversible. Mm -hmm. Well, I like how you kind of you went through, because it's important to recognize that there are different reasons why a person might have hypothyroid. Um, and I really like how you highlight that, you know, although this information is, is really helpful, especially to get someone started if they think they might have a thyroid condition, but in order to figure out exactly what is going to work best for you, it's a process. It's not going to happen by pulling up the website and like reading through it once. And then, you know, it, it could take, um, well, you could maybe share more because you've worked, you know, supported people through this process for so long, but 
I'm get, like, it can take months. It could, it could take years. In your case, it took 20 years, but it could take years before you really get to that sweet spot where you're really clear on what exactly the dosing works the best for you and, and, and also your other levels. Because on your page, you go through all the, like a ton of different levels to check to see if you're within the normal range of different, not just the thyroid hormone, but as you mentioned, iron and you mentioned, you know, a, a whole bunch of other factors there. Yeah, and let me say that it, it took me years. It doesn't take years to adequately treat your hypothyroidism. It took me years of being on T4 only to finally figure out it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's why I do what I do. I do what I do for the purest of reasons. It wasn't at first to make a living. I was angry as hell that I had to go 20 years and not one doctor. And I saw many ever put it together, it was because Synthroid sucks. And so does the TSH. So purest of reasons, I said, I don't want other people to go through this. That was hell. And so that's why I started the group. That's why we started talking. That's why I started compiling what we were learning on Stop the Thyroid Madness. And that moved into the books and the Facebook page so that patients don't have to go through the hell that I went through. They can be better informed as to why they feel like crap and what's the right way to deal with it? And there's a lot on there. You got to learn. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, you know, I, I agree. And I think it's really important to educate um, patients about their thyroid. I just, as someone who works with clients and, and works hard to support them when they're trying to figure out if there's something up with their thyroid and to support them in terms of educating about what tests are, are can be useful and how to figure all of this out so that they feel better. Because, of course that's really the goal so that you feel better. <laughs> it's not so that some number is correct on some lab. It's so that you, you actually feel better and do better and have energy and don't need a nap every day in the afternoon or whatever the case is so that your hair stops falling out or, you know, so that your menstrual cycles are, are within normal ranges instead of being all over the place. And so ultimately that is the goal. But somehow doctors seem to have missed the mark with regards to what the goal is. Uh, for them, it seems to be more of a getting the number on the chart to fit where, what they think it should. Exactly. And that's what's so wrong. And I always say they're trying to get an ink spot on a piece of paper in a ridiculous range. And that's, that's not what it's about. Those are just ink spots on a piece of paper. And we still have symptoms. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think I mentioned to you in our pre-chat that I'm, I'm almost starting to feel like it's when you send somebody out to get lab work, it's like you're sending, <laughs> it's like you're sending a lamb to the slaughter. Um, most doctors are not really open to, to whether they're not even open to doing the tests, like not even open to ordering it or, and then if they do order it, they're not open to prescribing anything other than Synthroid or, um, uh, or another T4 only synthetic uh, version. And so, I mean, your suggestions to fire your doctor, do you have any words of encouragement for a person who has maybe gone through it? So they're listening and they've gone through it. They've been to three doctors and they've had all these conversations. Maybe they've left the the uh, the doctor's office crying because they, it was just, you know what I mean? Like it's just such a hard fight. Uh, wondering why they have to fight so hard just to get a lab test. Do you have any words of encouragement for someone who's found themselves in that type of position? Oh, I do. You know, you can find a better doctor. It, it, it can be done. And I say that because of me. I mean, I've lived in some rural areas where all the doctors that were not even nearby were Synthroid worshipers, which was stupid. And I thought, oh, my God, what am I going to do? But one thing that has been successful for a lot of people is to call your pharmacies, notice I said plural, because sometimes <laughs> more than one, and ask the pharmacist, I need to find a doctor who prescribes desiccated thyroid. Do you know of one in this area? Now, do you hear how, how innocent I sounded? <laughs> I need to find a doctor. You don't want to say, who's prescribing desiccated thyroid? I, we've learned that the hard way, because then they get defensive, and they say they can't give that out, which is false. But I... I, I, I Ask them based on emotion. I'm, I'm really needed a better doctor and I'm not having one. Do you know of any? That's the first way. And, and I have found a better doctor that way. And so have many others. The, but, but that's half of the story. Not only do you have to do what it takes to find a more open-minded doctor and one who might be prescribing it, 
But the second thing falls on your shoulders. You've got to become informed, which is why Stop the Thyroid Madness is there for you. you got to learn this. you got to learn, here's what I start on. Here's how I raise it. Here's what I work for. Here's how to read lab work. That is why the books and the website are there for you. Because if you continue doing what we're all taught to do, put all our apples in the doctor's cart, we stay sick. Can't do that. You've got to accept that no doctor's going to be perfect. Even the ones that prescribe desiccated thyroid are not there yet. And you've got to be prepared. You're going to have to guide them. Hmm. Those are strong words. And I yep. think... I think they're, well, I know that they're truthful ones uh, in the sense that, you know, you, you may not find the support that you need, especially right away. So if you find yourself in a doctor's office and you ask for a full panel, you know, antibodies, reverse T3, the whole gamut of, of thyroid testing, and your doctor's like, sure, that's great. I do this all the time. Then you've probably hit the lottery. <laughs> but yeah. for the rest of you, that's, that may not be your experience, you know, the first time you, you, you show up there. I did a, a really interesting interview um, that I'll link to in the show notes with Dr. Miranda Naylor. And so um, Dr. Naylor, she is a medical doctor and she had been on the pill for a number of years and she came off the pill to find that she didn't have her period. And I think to date, she, she still hasn't had her, got her period back and it's been over two years, if I remember correctly. And so as a medical doctor, uh, she was going to other doctors to seek support for this. And so uh, I invited her on the show because of course, as you can imagine, her experience is so unique, right? Being a doctor going to doctors and not being served in the way that she needs to by doctors. And so we had a really interesting conversation about how to approach your physician. Because Janie, you said something earlier that's really important, which is there's no point in fighting <laughs> with your doctor about this. You're not going to change your doctor's mind. No, there, there, there are very few that you can. They're, they're trained rigidly. They believe that their training is from God Almighty um, or they're worried about being reported by their other other uh, colleagues. See, that's a big concern. Um, doctors, I found out, are not sued just because a patient sued them. They're also sued because that patient went to another doctor who was even worse for another condition. That other doctor saw what the first doctor was prescribing, desiccated thyroid and not going by the TSH, and that doctor implements the problem. He reports your doctor um, to the board. So you, th there are a lot of reasons why they're so horrible. Um, so they're, they're afraid or they're poorly trained or they got huge egos. But we, we all face that. It's, it's horrible. You know, this is why um, we all may have to go in the hospital for something someday. And hospitals are even worse. They'll, they'll take you off a of desiccated thyroid, put you on Synthroid. They'll go by the TSA to lower your, to lower your, you've got to have an advocate uh, who understands what you want, why you want, uh, want it. And, and so what I've done is I've typed up a, and I've seen horrible stories of what happens to people when they go to the hospital, thyroid patients. I typed up what I call my hospital page and I type up, here's what I'm on. Here's why I'm on it. Here's how much I have to have, and here's why I can't get on the other one. And I have that prepared that if I ever have to go to the hospital, I told my husband, you come get that page, and my advocate fight for me that that's what I stay on so that I can get well again. Hmm. That's really scary. I never thought about that uh, particular implication in the hospital. <laughs> well, it is scary, and I'm not, I'm not saying this because I made it up. I've, oh, my gosh, I've seen... One gal um, had a heart problem that was unrelated or some kind of problem unrelated to her thyroid was on T3 only, which she had to be on for, for something else. She was making too much RT3. They, she was on like, I think her optimal dose was 100 micrograms. They, they refused to give her that much because it suppressed her TSH, would only give her five micrograms. And she had uh, her parathyroids had been removed. Uh, because she had once had cancer, and they removed her parathyroids and her thyroid, so if she required calcium, they were not giving her calcium, she could have died. And that really affected me when I when I heard about that, and I've heard about other horror stories. So, you know, we we have it hard. You can find better doctors. Don't, don't I'm painting a swath of a negativity. You can find better doctors, 
but you still have to become informed. You cannot just walk in there uninformed. You got to do your work to find a doctor to prescribe desiccated thyroid. And you better write all this out and have an advocate if you have to go to the hospital. It'll get better someday. But right now, that's where we are. Well, you know, that's what I was going to ask you about. So, you know, <laughs> right now it's, you know, we're getting that kind of dismal feeling like, oh, doctors, no one's going to support me. No one's going to help me. But obviously there are better doctors out there that are at least open to doing some of the tests, maybe not all of them, but some of them. Yes. <laughs> but, um, you know, what are your views then on the future or has there been improvement so far or do you think oh, that there will uh, be? <laughs> both ways. Um, because of Stop the Thyroid Madness. Some doctors are changing the way they practice. Now, that doesn't mean they've been reading it. I know they have, even though some of them will deny it. <laughs> but it's because I created STEM to educate you so that you can take this information to the doctor's office and make it clear this is what you want to do or I'm firing you. And it's worked. There are now more of them that prescribe desiccated thyroid. But growth is a wiggly line. Like I said, you may find more today than you did 10 years ago who will prescribe it, but they may not know how to dose it. And that's why you've got to learn it. As far as the future, yes, I have no doubt we'll have bumps in the road, you know, but I think, yeah, they're They're going to finally get it. And they're going to finally see that it really is changing lives. And it, it'll, I really believe it'll move that way. Now I didn't say it's going to be a smooth transition because we have to deal with the FDA and their stupidity and supporting the pharmaceuticals over us. Who knows what's going to happen with that? Um, so there may be bumps in the road, but really, I think ultimately, as more and more people move over to desiccated thyroid and doctors see their cholesterol comes down. Now, I'm talking about an optimal dose. Their cholesterol comes down. Their blood pressure comes down. They feel better. They don't have chronic fatigue. They don't have fibromyalgia anymore. Their hair came back on and on and on. They're going to get it. Mm -hmm. Well, I have two more questions for you, Janie. Given our discussion today, what is the one thing that you'd want our listeners to take away from this conversation? Uh, one thing is you are your own best advocate, not the doctor. You are. So you've got to become informed so that when you go in there, you can say what you want. You don't go in there and say, will you help me? No, that's not your attitude. You go in there because you're now informed, which Stop the Thyroid Madness is a, and meant to help you be. Hi, I'm pretty sure I'm hypothyroid. I hear are the tests that I want because patients have been reporting this for years that these are important and I and I would like a copy of them when I get them back so that you can go to the lab values page because they're not going to understand that. And then when you ask for medication, no, I do not want to be on only one of five hormones. I've seen too much success with desiccated thyroid. That's what I want to be on. See the difference? You're telling them politely what you want to be on and why and how you'll do it. And that's really the way I approach doctors. I, I look for one who's going to respect my knowledge, and they most of them eventually just kind of are passive and go. They go my. Direction. So you are your own best advocate, not your doctor. And then if you have a doctor that is completely not open to it, you say fire your doctor, get a new one. <laughs> you got it. You know they're working for you. You're paying them to work for you. And if they're not helping you, I mean, sure, you can choose to stay with them, but you're, we just see it too often. People get worse. Mm -hmm. If they're not going to help you, you got to do whatever it takes to find a better, more open-minded doctor that you can also guide. Mm -hmm. Well, and last question of the day, um, and we've probably touched on this, but if there's one myth about, you know, thyroid health, thyroid disease that you want to kind of squash, what would that be? A myth of thyroid disease I want to squash, that you're going to get diagnosed by the TSH. All right. Because <laughs> it, it, it can take years before it rises high enough to reveal your hypothyroid state. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great way to end the show. Janie, I just want to thank you so much for being here. You know, I think all of the listeners can feel your passion, your drive, and your determination to share this knowledge. And if you think about it, 20 years to have this kind of undiagnosed thyroid is a horrible thing to go through. And I think it's pretty amazing and incredible that you were able to turn that experience into something positive and really try to change the way that thyroid issues are addressed. So I just want to thank you for that. <laughs> and I know you've mentioned your website, so I think the listeners know where to go for more information, but you can leave us with uh, your website and where to go for more information about the book and, and the work that you do. The website, which is totally free, you just got to spend time, is stop 
thethyroidmadness.com. It's a big website now. You will also see mention of books because a lot of people preferred the books. The first one has all the people on the front. It's a compilation of what patients reported and learned. There are some things in the book that are not on the website and vice versa. The second book is called Stop the Thyroid Madness 2. I had doctors who were way better than others contribute chapters. Now, I'm not saying they're perfect. Don't take that. But they contributed chapters, one on desiccated thyroid, one on the TSH, and on and on. I did that. It helps. It's for patients, too. It's not just a doctor book. But I also did it so that doctors could see that, hey, some of their colleagues <laughs> agree with us about desiccated thyroid. Now, by the way, P.S., there are occasional misspelled words because these doctors do not know how to write or spell, and we didn't catch it all. <laughs> Came from then, overlooked them. There are occasional ones because doctors have terrible spelling skills. <laughs> but overall, it's a great second book, um, which you can use to become informed so that you can get well. And we have a Stop with Thyroid Madness Facebook page. And by the way, one last thing before we go, beware, because there are a lot of thyroid groups that in order to attract high amounts of likes are going to tell you whatever works. If you're doing great on T4, great. We don't say that. And we, we, we don't say it because patient experiences prove over and over and over and over that even those who are doing great, they start seeing things creep up. So we speak the truth of patient experiences, not trying to track massive amount of likes. So you use your own judgment, but I just want to warn you. <laughs> so you've got the STEM Facebook page. Well, thank you so much for being here, Janie. It was a pleasure being able to talk to you and kind of hash out some of these topics with you. So I, I'm really happy and I think the listeners will get a lot out of this interview, a lot of motivation, especially if they've had negative experiences with their own physicians. Great. Lisa, I, I think you are a great interviewer. People are lucky that they have your programs and I hope they really are listening to you. You sound great. Oh, thanks so much, Janie. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode at fertilityfriday.com slash 116. I hope that you enjoyed my episode today with Janie Bothorp. It was so much fun talking to her about thyroid. And as you can tell, I've had my own experiences with thyroid related issues. And I've also supported a number of my clients through the challenge of, of getting the right testing and really trying to figure out whether or not there's something going on with their thyroid. And what I find interesting from my perspective as a fertility awareness educator and instructor is that, you know, thyroid issues are one of the most common reasons for menstrual cycle irregularities. And so naturally, uh, if you have menstrual cycle irregularities, that's one of the first places that we want to look into and find out if there could be something going on there, if that could be a contributing factor. And I think the interesting thing is that if your thyroid is not being addressed, you know, properly and not being supported properly. So for example, if you are one of those people that doesn't convert very well the T4 hormone to T3, then if you're taking something like Synthroid, which, uh, you know, as, as Janie and I spoke about, is uh, T4 only. So if you're taking something like Synthroid that's T4 only, then your body has to convert that into T3. And if you're not a good converter, then even though your T4 levels are going to look normal, and the fact that you have lots of T4 is going to make your body suppress your TSH. So your TSH levels are going to look great and your T4 levels are going to look great. Your cells can't actually use any of that. <laughs> and so you may still continue to have symptoms and it may still be negatively impacting your cycles, even though your test results are looking normal. And so I think that one of the biggest challenges for the clients that I work with is trying to advocate for themselves and for yourself if you have happened to find yourself in, in a situation where you need some support for your thyroid. And it can be really challenging because it's, it's kind of like you have to be prepared to get a door slammed in your face. It, it could take several times for you to, you know, you may have to seek several different physicians to get the care that you want, or you may have to seek uh, someone who's coming from a functional perspective, or you may have to seek a naturopath or someone who specializes in thyroid disorders and really looking into them from a functional perspective. And as Janie alluded to, even if you do that, you may still come up against some challenges with respect to getting the proper care that you need. So the hardest part, I think, is that you kind of end up needing that support and you also need to educate yourself about it. It's not something that that's really easy to do. 
it's not the type of thing where you can just go into one doctor typically and have all the tests done that you want without issue, the correct interpretation of those tests, and then a proper prescription for the medication that you would like to try. It often ends up uh, differently. And so, you know, I just want to end by saying that, of course, this episode is not meant to be medical advice, and it is important to make sure to consult with a medical provider or a health professional before you make any changes to your you know, diet, supplementation routine, all those types of things. And of course, with that in mind, it's, it's equally important for you to educate yourself to the best of your ability and advocate for yourself when necessary to make sure that you're getting the best care. Um, because you deserve to feel better. And I think at the end of the day, that's what this is really about. I think this could apply beyond the thyroid to any other health conditions that you may be facing. But ultimately, a lab test can tell you a lot, but you and your own awareness of how you feel in your body, that's kind of where this all comes back to. Um, Fertility awareness opens up these amazing doors and allows all of us allows you allows me to get a much clearer and more intimate understanding of our body how it works and how all of these different things that happen in our life are related to our cycles and that leads us to this whole other place of body literacy and so one of the things to keep in mind in terms of advocating for yourself and being really clear on what's happening with you is tuning into your own body and asking yourself how do you feel because if, if you don't feel good, if there's something going on, you don't have energy or you feel kind of depressed, you feel super anxious or just in general, you know that there's something that's wrong and you know that you don't, you, you don't usually feel this way or it just feels off, but your tests are quote unquote normal. I think that there comes a time when you have to tune into your own body and tune into how you feel and trust your own intuition and just don't give up. Don't stop finding those answers that you're looking for. Because as Janie talked about, (laughs) if you're not getting the results you want with one health practitioner, go to another one. If you're feeling really confused and, and challenged and nervous, find a healthcare practitioner or find somebody who who's really putting you first and concerned with how you feel and how you're doing and invested in your health. And as I always say, nobody cares more about your health than you do. And so it may not be an easy road, but uh, it's worth it to advocate for what you want. And if you're not getting the care that you need, then it might be time to look for a healthcare practitioner who's willing to support you in the ways that you know you deserve to be supported. So if you've been enjoying the podcast, please look for it on iTunes and leave a five-star review so that more people can find it. And make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com and join my email list. And I just want to thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I really appreciate all of you for taking the time to tune into the podcast, whatever it is that you're doing, whether you're going for a run or whether you're commuting to work, whatever it is. I just want to thank you for letting me be part of your day. And as always, until next time, be well and happy charting. Happy charting.